So in the age we're heading toward, we're going to have lots of sensors on our wrists. We're going to have wearable computers on our eyes. We're going to have multiple screens, with whether it's an iPad or an Android tablet or a big screen. And how are we going to play new kinds of games and new kinds of applications and get that stuff all synced up in real time? Well, Kazing has a way to use their WebSocket technology to do just that, and it's really fascinating. We're going to see it right now. Who are you? Oh, I'm, I'm Jonas Jacoby. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Gazing. I'm ex-Swede. Uh, I am a computer whiz. Uh, as my baseline, I used to work at Oracle. I used to be a product manager for a product that is now called Apache Trinidad, which is a server-side rendered UI technology called Java Server Faces. Uh, and I got an opportunity to uh, meet my co-founder for Gazing at Oracle, and we had a lot of fun time. We wrote a book together and eventually we got an opportunity to start Kazang. So we're, we're going to get a little geekier. This, this is not a technology that, this is not, not uh, like Angry Birds or yeah. a, a, a new Apple iPhone or anything like that. Uh, what are you doing <laughs> Kazang? <laughs> <laughs> well, so, so one of the things that we, uh, uh, we uh, had problems with back uh, in the early days when we worked at Oracle, we were designing UI technology for Oracle uh, and, and for a particular division within Oracle. And one of the challenges we had was to uh, make applications more interactive, allowing people to build applications that were truly uh, interactive in the sense that they can either collaborate, they can get email notifications over the web in a true fashion, right, without having to rely on traditional HTTP polling techniques, right? Yeah. Uh, and one of the things that we struggled with was just the HTTP layer. Uh, and eventually we had a chance to say, we left Oracle, we had a chance to really sit back and think about how do we solve this problem? How do we address this problem with, uh, with the web as a whole, right? Because if you're looking at the entire architecture we have, on the, on the inside of our firewalls, we have free access to pretty much anything we want to reach over TCP. We can use any type of communication format that we like, whether it's JMS APIs, JDBC, SQL Net, XMPP, you name it, we have it. As soon as we go over the web, everything is the same. It's like a one-size-fits-all way to communicate HTTP, period. Uh, and we felt that was very restrictive uh, and very limiting. So we had an opportunity. Uh, we got uh, invited by Ian Hickson, the HTML5 editor, to help out and participate in the uh, initial drafts of this new web communication layer called WebSocket. And this WebSocket API, the first time it uh, showed up in the specification as, as WebSocket was this, the uh, late spring, early summer of 2008. And since then, we have been sort of on the road promoting this new standard as much as we can because we believe that in order for the web to move forward and become exactly everything that we need it to be in terms of connecting our watches to our system on the back so I can actually view it on my phone, etc., we need something that is much better than HTTP to communicate yeah. with. And for us, going down the path of enabling uh, full duplex communication over the web was just a fundamental decision to be had. You have a demo with this race car, and, yeah. and uh, it, well, show me that what what it, how fast it is, right? Well, so uh, this this car um, is a HTML5 WebGL graphic, uh, and um, what it does is essentially takes in. Um, controls or uh, assignments from any device. It can be from the keyboard, too, if you want to. But and we're here in San Francisco. There's a server in Boston. Exactly. So, the so your, your iPhone is going to talk to the server in Boston and do something on the screen. Absolutely. So this application is served out from a server in Boston. Okay. And then uh, you can use a smartphone like this and connect to it, and then you can start driving it. And you connect to the same application in Boston, and it allows you to control it. You can turn left. You can turn right, you can stop, you can go backwards. It all depends on what you want to do. Uh, and what it happens is, is that a signal is sent, a message is sent from this phone to the server in Boston, it bounces back. And the only latency we have seen so far is the length of the cable, speed of light, essentially, from here to Boston and back. The, the way we've designed our product, in this case, the, the gateway, is to basically act as a gateway, not as a server where you terminate your connection and communication and then transfer it into something else. We actually let the communication flow back to the system that we try to reach. So in all three tiers, the, the, the phone, 
the server in here and the web browser. Because this is running a web browser with WebGL, right? Yes, it is. How much code did we have to write to make this happen? Well, the only code that you had to write for this particular demo is the code on the client, which in this case is WebGL based for the browser, and then some minor JavaScript code for the phone that sends and receives the signal turn left, turn right from the Tilt API on the phone itself. There's no server-side logic at all on this demo. The only thing you had to set up is the Kazin gateway and your favorite broker, message broker, if you have one, and that's it. There's no code, there's minor configuration to get it to work. So uh, before we go geekier, how, how do you guys get paid for it? Is this uh, something I pay to build an app like this, or how do, how do you get paid, I guess? So, so we have, there's two ways you can get hold of our software. Either you can do it the traditional way, you just buy perpetual licenses, or yeah, you use it on a cloud infrastructure where we charge per hour and bandwidth, like everybody else does on the cloud. Okay. And uh, it's very easy to set up, uh, and the cost in general, if you go on the cloud side, is very nominal, because it's also a lot more efficient over the wire, so you send less data, meaning that you pay less yep. than you would with a traditional uh, HTTP-based solution. So now let's dive, dive into the, the geeky parts. First of all, what, what did you expect people to do with this? Because we're heading in a new age where we're gonna have like Pebble watches on our wrist or the basis sensor, they're gonna have 22 sensors and they're gonna spray data up somewhere. Yeah. I think uh, what most people will do, uh, most people would like to control their own environment, especially if I'm the guy providing the watch in this case, and I'm say I'm Nike and I wanna you know, have a watch where we meet heartbeats and everything, everything else. That's probably a service that Nike will offer. What we hope to be is to become that uh, communication layer for them in order for them to uh, deliver on that experience. Because one of the things that we've known and learned over the past 20 years is obviously that latency is important. I remember when I got my first Windows machine and I started typing and I thought it was so fast and then two years later it was going to keep up with my typing. Uh, and we're still in that mode where we're accelerating through uh, demand on latency. So even if initially the business is not latency sensitive, it will be latency sensitive as soon as we get into this next stage. So what do you expect people to build with this? What kinds of use cases? Are they gonna build games that do like race cars or are they gonna do it, use some, do something more serious in, in the world? Yeah, I think we're gonna see a little bit of both depending on needs, right? But I, I think in our case, we have a lot of customers in the banking financial sector where they actually build web-based trading solutions. Uh, and for them, this kind of infrastructure is criti critical because it gets them the ability to reach their trading systems without having to rely on HTTP as the main transportation vehicle. Now they can actually extend the reach of those trading systems all the way out to the web client. That's on the more serious side, right? So that's your money, basically, they're trading with. Uh, on, the, on the other side of that is obviously the more fun part. What else can we do with a technology like this, other to what you uh, already alerted to? Uh, what else can we connect to these uh, systems? We have a client that is connecting cars to, uh, through the gateway and then up to a a web interface so you can actually see where the car is and you can turn it off you can you know slow it down you can, a little bit like the the system that we've seen in place already in some other cars out there but this so is could i build a would i use this for like an app like ways where you see uh, lots of people driving around the freeways oh, yeah yeah we, we, oh by the way the geeky stuff we had a hackathon about a year and a half ago in singapore we had a lot of kids uh, hacking on this and uh, they built solutions for public transportation in 24 hours and awesome solutions where they had where you can track the person ordering the taxi on the phone and the taxi driver had a display like an iPad style display yep. in the car and they could follow along where the person was walking you know where it's where are you heading oh, I'm going heading towards that intersection I'll catch you at that intersection and it was just phenomenal to see how fast so, these guys So it's sort of an Uber kind of thing, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. I mean, it was just fun to see how these kids came up with these solutions where they can actually build very interactive solutions, in this case, for the public transportation sector. Why is this so much more effective than, uh, or efficient than using an HTTP call? Why, and, and maybe explain how much data goes over the wire and how many, how many round trips to the server happen. We, we know that HTTP is request response driven. It always initiates from the client. So the client has to ask for information. It's like 
driving down to your parents and with the kids in the back seat and it's a five hour drive and they're gonna ask every five minutes, are we there yet, are we there yet, are we there yet? And they, they only respond back, or if there is anyone, if you get bored after one say, I'm not gonna even respond to this question, it's, you send a response back, no, we're not there, we're not there. But every time there's a request, there's an overhead of data that is sent, also affecting scalability and other things on the system in the back. And it's, so what the new standard allows us to do, the WebSocket standard allows us to do is to connect once and then stay connected. Now I can actually send data in both directions. So it's like having the kids in the back seat and they only ask you once and say, when are we gonna be there? And you say, let me tell you when you actually arrive. And when you arrive, just tell them. You just turn around and say, we're, now we're here kids. So what WebSocket allows you to do is to reduce all the intermittent requests for information that we've had in the past in between and now they're gone. So you can just connect safely knowing that I will be notified as soon as something has changed on the server. Yeah. Or if I want to change, I can send a notification down, hey, I want to know about something else. Like, like when you turn the, the phone, the sensor was spitting out data yes. and messages. Yes, exactly. How many messages a second can I spit to your servers? Uh, it depends on what you're trying to do, but we've had clients doing, uh, try to do 10,000 updates a second to a client, a browser. Okay. That's pushing it a little bit because what you get into at that point in time is can the browsers keep up, can your desktop keep up uh, with that speed. But the, the amount of, of data that at least the Chrome browser managed to do when we did a test was about 50 megabyte a second down to the client. But then you need, to, you need to parse that and you need to process that. But we made a test to make sure that that was feasible. I wouldn't say that's a re realistic scenario. Probably somewhere between 20 to 100 is realistic. At this point, we do a lot of uh, uh, online betting. It's usually around 20 to 100 updates per second. So these sensors, as I move them, or if I wear Google mm -hmm. Glasses, are probably spitting up more. So do you have to write a little bit of code to throw away some of that data, or, or only? You can. I mean, okay. they're, 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 in our case, the gateway comes with uh, filtering, so you can actually make sure that it drops messages if they're not delivered. It depends on your sensitivity, right? Okay. If you're a bank, you might not even care about the things that are dropped. But depending what type of data you should, send to the user or receive. Some of it may not be relevant and just let it be, yeah. uh, but it's called conflation. Uh, but the, um, the part that is interesting here is that it doesn't matter. We can, we can receive more data from the client than the client can receive. Right. right. So in this case, it's just a matter of how well have I designed my web user interface. So if we're looking at some of the demos that we have, for example, on the phone, we can do 100 updates easily on a, in a browser, even on a phone like this. And the fun part with it is that what we've done and tested recently is that we, if you want to do this with other technologies, we're about 50% more efficient on battery life than anything else. So, uh, you know, in these things we have sensors, so I turn the phone and it spits a bunch of messages yeah. over to Kazing. Yeah. Can Kazing uh, control only one computer or can, can it control millions of computers? For instance, can I put sensors on an Olympic athlete and then build a new kind of uh, visualization oh, system so I could watch at home that Olympic athlete running yes. or jumping? Or oh, something? absolutely. One, one of the things that we're working with right now is uh, with the race car company. I'm, I can't announce it yet, but yeah. I will eventually. I'll let you know. Uh, and they are tracking telemetry data from the car. And they want to track telemetry data from all cars so that fans can pick and choose what car they want to follow during race day. Oh, that's cool. That is cool. That's I, I bet cool. it's going to be a Formula One thing because that's where the money is to do this kind of stuff. <laughs> but that's like to your point, right? I mean, yes, you can track anything. And the data um, that you send out, remember, it's only from one user. If, it, if it's just a race car or a person yeah. running, right? It's data from one user that goes into a system somewhere and then it needs to be broadcast over the web. And then they would use something like our WebSocket gateway to do that. And we've already done scalability tests like on the geeky side where you know we're, we're down in the very, very few microseconds in latency, and depending on the scale you want to do, we've done, uh, we've done actually tests up to a million connections on a single rack uh, server. Uh, but then you get into uh, how much data can the, the server, it's a physical hardware actually cope with yeah. when you send data over the wire. So having a million users on a single rack server is probably not um, practical, yeah. but there's really no scalability problems on a solution like this. It, it changes everything regarding yeah. web tier architecture. Like you said, web tier, we're seeing Windows 8 coming out this week, um, and Windows 8 has a really nice uh, HTML5 browser. Is this considered part of HTML5, or is this separate? Is this uh, a message bus 
infrastructure that's separate from HTML5? Uh, no, I mean, HTML5 is, has become a, a little bit of a, a brand name for a lot of technologies. Yeah. Uh, CSS, three years one, for example, right? Uh, and WebSocket as a standard itself started off in the HTML5 specification and then split into two parts. And with one part is still with the HTML5 specification. It's the APIs that JavaScript developers would code against. Yeah. And then there's another part that it is part of the IETF or, uh, group that allows us to actually create different types of client technologies to use the same protocol. So for example, right now there's a lot of JavaScript, but you have other technologies that benefit from this standard too, like Object C, even traditional Java, um, even Flash, Flex, .NET clients, for example, can all code against the standard protoc protocol like TCP, which will allow us to actually connect, to your point, any type of device yep. over the web with the same web infrastructure that we have in place today, which in regards to security, uh, primarily. Yeah. Are there uh, competitors that, uh, for you that, that you know, a developer can do the same thing or similar thing? And, there, and there then are. How do you differentiate from that competitive landscape, yes. I guess? Um, so th there are a few. Uh, no, I wouldn't say that there's too many, but there's a lot of projects starting up that we are very excited to see coming on board that uh, try to leverage this WebSocket standard itself. It's a standard, after all, so everybody should implement it. Uh, we're trying to educate the market to uh, leverage WebSocket the right way. It's so easy to look at something new and say, oh, uh, I'm just going to bolt it on and make it a slightly better Ajax. That was not the intent. Yeah. The intent was to be able to stretch and reach into the systems on the back directly. So that, for example, if I have an XMPP server that I would like to reach, I should be able to reach that easily from the browser directly through something like a gateway that we have to the XMPP server without actually having to write one line of code in the, in the web tier layer and use XMPP as my API on the client side. Yeah. Why would I have to reinvent the wheel again? No one else codes against TCP if you're looking at the, the broader world. Most people code against higher level app APIs like XMPP, IRC, VNC, JDBC drivers, JMS APIs, whatever it is. Why wouldn't we have access to those on the web as well? And this is what WebSocket brings. It brings us that simplicity of reaching into the systems in the back securely. Yeah. So how do you differentiate from the other WebSocket? Uh, uh, I think right now there's a, the they, yeah, I think a lot of uh, a lot of these projects uh, struggle still with the fact that um, the WebSocket specification is fairly new. Uh, mo all the modern browsers have support for WebSocket, uh, including these smartphones. Yeah. Uh, however, there's still lack of support in older browsers like IE6 and IE7 yep. and IE8 and IE9 and others um, that you have to support as well. And that's where we differentiate ourselves. We have the identical WebSocket APIs exposed even in those browser environments. Yeah. So that a developer can code against native or the exact WebSocket APIs uh, without actually having to change anything in the future. Uh, and that makes it a very transparent way for us to offer a good service to them. But it also allows them to, if they don't like us link, uh, anymore, they can easily just swap us out for something else that might come in the future. We like that. You yeah. know, here at Rackspace, we're on OpenStack for the same reason. Yeah. We, we uh, appreciate the open world. Um, anything else I need to know uh, about using this? Is, uh, talk to the developers. Is there some, anything architecturally that's... Uh, that they need to know about this? No, I don't think so. I mean, our implementation is written in Java, so the only, in our case, the only thing that you need is a, a, a server and an operating system and then something that can run Java. And this runs on Rackspace Cloud or Absolutely. Amazon Cloud or yeah. any of the yeah. cloud services? Absolutely, yeah. So it's, there's, cool. And the setup is actually a lot easier than people think. It's not as complicated as going down and try to build an application using a traditional web application server. This is a much more straightforward than we've seen in the past. Most of our customers are coming back right now telling us that, that, yes, the benefits are speed and scale for sure, but it's actually productivity that they start leaning towards because now the web tier doesn't care as much about, are you a .NET developer or are you a Flex developer or are you a Java applet developer or JavaScript developer? The gateway only cares about the communication layer that you're all agreeing that we're gonna use this API to communicate with it doesn't really matter. So you get a, little bit, a very nice unified architecture for your web tier. 
with the same security, scalability characteristics that you would need, right? So it doesn't matter what client you use. Yeah. Tell, tell me a little bit about your company. How was it funded and, and how, what kind of company are you building? So uh, we are uh, building a company focusing primarily on this WebSocket technology. Uh, we've been around since 2007 uh, and um, we are actually uh, angel funded. We have not raised a traditional VC round. Uh, and uh, we uh, we're moving very very f rapidly towards uh, cash flow positive right now, which is good. We're about fifty people. Very cool. That's yeah. uh, that's awesome. Well, this this is going to be more and more and more important as we get more and more devices and more Absolutely. and more sensors, um, and more and more uh, things are going to hook together. Because yes. right now there's. You know, every app on my iPhone is a little data silo, but soon those are going to start snapping together and, and sharing data between them. Yeah. And uh, yeah. they're probably going to do that part, at least in part, with, with your technology. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's important to recognize, obviously the industry has already recognized that smartphones and tablets are taking over the, the sales in terms of comparing to PCs at least. But I don't think uh, the web is, you know, that's still only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the web as a whole. I think we've we think we've seen so much with the web, and yes, the web has grown tremendously over the past couple of years. But I think we haven't seen anything yet. No. Uh, just let the, the you know the clothing manufacturers and the designers jump in on this, and we're going to see a whole new world. Get the car manufacturers to jump in and build web-enabled devices in the car, and then suddenly you can hook up your car to your service provider or the service station. So they can keep track of your car for you while you're actually using it. So they can tell you, send you notification to your car or to your phone or anywhere else, or you can monitor, where has my car been over the past weekend? Well, yeah. I was gone and my kids were <coughs> at home. There's so much you can do, and it's not just tied to web browsers anymore. You can track anything. Well, and you can see if they were speeding in your car too. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and probably. by the way, that, that's why you need a high-speed message bus, right? To yes. send many, many messages over time, right? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, we. we as individuals, we are looking for more data. Are you um, able to log these messages, by the way? Are oh, you? yeah, sure. I mean, you can, uh, depending on your uh, desire, you can uh, use uh, audit trails. So one of the things that we offer is uh, what we call guaranteed and reliable message delivery, which allows you to actually get an acknowledgement back when the data has received or when they've been sent to the client. So that when I send you a statement for, it could be a trade, for example, I know that it actually reached your browser client or the, the client that uh, you, you accessed it from. And I get an acknowledgement back saying, hey, received on a specific date or time. Uh, you can also get, uh, since you're connected all the time, uh, as if I'm the system provider, I'm, I'm the offering the service, I can detect if that connection is terminated, which is not the case today, right? I send a request in, and I get a response back and then I'm more or less disconnected. So if I go away, the other side won't notice until there's a timeout. In this case, if I connect, it could be my, by mistake, network goes down, you can re-establish that connection and you will know immediately if that connection is gone yeah. as a provider. Since we're on wireless devices now, uh, Wi-Fi sometimes yeah. disappears, right? Yeah. <laughs> I drive over a, a Highway 1 and there's a good segment of that road where there's no connectivity. Yeah. Do you have to write your own logic to store those messages until there's a no, no connectivity? No, you don't have to. I mean, you can, depending on what type of system you decide to use and design. Uh, but what we, try to, what we try to do is to making all of that very simple, right? So that we have a reconnect, so that when you drive in through, say that you drive through a tunnel, yeah. connectivity goes away. Uh, as soon as you come out of the other end, it will automatically reestablish the connection. And, and all the data that you have missed will either be sent to you if the service provider decides that that's important to you, or they will just drop it, depending on how they want to do it. Very cool. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I, I could talk to you for hours, because yeah. you're really uh, the underpinnings of a whole new age of things that are coming. Uh, where do I learn more about you? Uh, you can go to kazing.com. And how do you spell it? Because it's an unusual spelling. Uh, K-A-A-Z-I-N-G.com. Very cool. Yeah. And uh, you're on Twitter and Facebook. And Absolutely. All, all over the place, yeah. Well, thank you for what you're doing. It's yeah. really cool. Yeah, thank you. It's been great being here.